Hey all, Ron here from Military Images Magazine with a new episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail. Today, I want to take you to the aftermath of the Battle of Gettysburg. Following the retreat back to Virginia by the Army of Northern Virginia, General Robert E. Lee wrote a letter offering to resign to President Jefferson Davis. The Confederate Commander-in-Chief refused to accept Lee's noble gesture. Meanwhile, a similar drama played out in the United States. The victor at Gettysburg, Major General George G. Meade of the Army of the Potomac, offered to resign to President Abraham Lincoln, who had expressed disappointment at Meade's lack of a vigorous pursuit of Lee. Just as Davis denied Lee, Commander-in-Chief Lincoln refused to accept Meade's noble gesture. Robert E. Lee's nephew, Fitzhugh Lee, noted the twin resignations in his 1894 book titled General Lee. Fitzhugh went on to describe his uncle and his famous war horse traveler. In it, Lee paints a vivid picture of the general of the Army of Northern Virginia. There are many descriptions of Lee. This one is particularly good, and I'd like to read it to you. So here's a description of General Robert E. Lee by his nephew, Fitzhugh. It begins, quote, the commanding generals of both armies, upright in character and scrupulous in the performance of their respective duties, were naturally sensitive to criticism and the curious spectacle was presented that, after a gigantic and fierce contest against each other, both should ask to be relieved from their commands. Fancy the grim veterans of the Army of Northern Virginia paraded in their campgrounds in that month of August 1863 to hear the announcement that Mr. Davis had accepted General Lee's resignation. There would have resounded from flank to flank, Leroy est mori. But when the younger and abler man, assuming that Lee's successor would be a younger and abler man, assumed command, the mummies of the Nile or the bones beneath the ruins of Pompeii could not be more silent than the refusal of these heroes to shout to Robert E. Lee's successor, Viva Leroy. The angel of peace would have appeared in the hour General Lee bid farewell to the Army of Northern Virginia and mounted traveler to ride away, for the rapid termination of the war would have simplified the duties of that younger and abler man. Traveler, the most distinguished of the general's war horses, was born near the Blue Sulphur Springs in West Virginia and was purchased by General Lee from Major Thomas L. Braun, who brought him from Captain James W. Johnston, the son of the gentleman who reared him. General Lee saw him first in West Virginia and afterward in South Carolina and was greatly pleased with his appearance. As soon as Major Braun ascertained that fact, the horse was offered the general as a gift but Lee declined, and Major Braun then sold him. He, Traveler, was four years old in the spring of 1861, and therefore only eight when the war closed. He was greatly admired for his rapid, springy walk, high spirit, bold carriage, and muscular strength. When a colt, he took the first premium at the Greenbrier Fair under the name of Jeff Davis. The general changed his name to Traveler. He often rode him in Lexington after the war, and at his funeral, Traveler followed the hearse. He was appraised by a board in August 1864 at $4,600 in Confederate currency. Though Lee was ready to cover his face with his mantle and die like an Athenian following Gettysburg, it would have broken his heart to have separated himself from his troops who, with empty haversacks, shoeless feet, tattered uniforms, but full cartridge boxes and bright bayonets, 
had, with such undaunted courage, nobly supported him at all times? And where would the Southern president have found an officer who was superior in vigorous strategy, fertility of resource, power of self-command, influence over others, patient endurance, or one more composed in victory or dignified in defeat? An English officer described him in the Pennsylvania campaign as having courtly manners and being full of dignity, that he had none of the small vices, such as smoking, drinking, chewing, and his bitterest enemy never accused him of any of the greater ones, that Lee was the handsomest man of his age that he ever saw, broad shoulders, well-made, well-set-up, a thorough soldier in appearance. He generally wore a long gray jacket with three stars on the collar, blue pants tucked into his Wellington boots, and a high felt hat. He never carried arms, but he always carried a pistol in the holster on the left of his saddle because more convenient to reach when dismounted and ammunition in the right holster. This pistol always hung over his bedpost in Lexington after the war and was discharged after his death, not a barrel missing fire. Lee was always neat and dressed in person and on the most arduous marches looked smart and clean and what is very pleasing to an Englishman, he rides a handsome horse, which is extremely well groomed. The removal from the command of the Union Army of such an excellent officer as Meade would have been an act of kindness to the Confederates, the appreciation of which would have been increased if Major General Henry Halleck had been appointed his successor. So there you have the description of General Lee by his nephew, Fitzhugh Lee. We have to understand that Fitzhugh, in praising his uncle and a personal hero would be effusive in his description, not only of Lee, but of Traveler. And yet this vivid description does fit other recollections of officers on both sides of the army of Lee. So thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next episode of Life on the Civil War Research Trail.